Okay, welcome to lesson eight, Patterns of Evolution. Uh, today we are going to look at some of the different patterns that, outco uh, that lead to outcomes, specifically with regards to how traits and species uh, arise when looking at the general pattern of start to finish of one species going through selective processes to become essentially a brand new species. Uh, so recall that natural selection leads to several predictable outcomes uh, that closely related species have homologous features, those similar structures with different functions, uh, specific uh, examples being mammalian limbs, humans and bat wings, uh, humans and bats are both mammals. The structure of the limbs are the same, even though they might have different functions. Modern species have what's called vestigial features. Uh, they are structures or systems that no longer serve a purpose, but were functional in the related species of the ancestors that we branched off from. Uh, so dogs have thumbs, for lack of a better word. Uh, humans have wisdom teeth, tailbones, and appendixes. Uh, so when we think about the remote islands that have those unique species, the descendants from a few individuals uh, who were able to travel across the ocean that seeded that island population, they would have similar structures and similar features to the species that were from the mainland. So the example here is Darwin's finches. Uh, so natural selection can lead to patterns in evolution. And there's a few things that I'm gonna talk about with regards to those patterns. And the first pattern that we're gonna look at is what's called adaptive radiation. That quick, rapid evolution of within only a few generations. And it leads to a new species that will fill a specific and unique ecological niche or role. They will use resources that were not utilized by any species previously, and they will um, not have to compete with any other species for that food or resource. That natural selection is based on an adaptive trait. And one example for this is the different beaks that depend on the food. So if you recall back from the first couple of lessons with regards to Darwin and his observation of the finches on the Galapagos, the the cool thing about this is, is that the adaptive radiation that you saw from that species over a very short period of time, over a couple of generations only, was that, that the bigger the beak became, it allowed for them to eat larger seeds. And those larger seeds were never before consumed by any species. And so this before never utilized resource is now utilized exclusively by species that it's for all intents and purposes, it's a new species of finches that have bigger beaks than the finches of the previous generations. The second aspect I wanna talk about is what's called divergent evolution. It's that ancestral species diverges into many different species. The process of divergent evolution takes a lot longer than adaptive radiation, and the species evolve separately to fill various ecological niches and roles. So two predictable outcomes of a divergent evolution is that competition has to be minimized between species is the first point. And then second species are using food and other resources efficiently. They take care of the resources that they utilize and they utilize it efficiency, meaning shelter, water, um, and mating is all done quite efficiently. So one example of that is Canadian rodents, squirrels, mice, beavers, cabin bear, all of those different types of rodents utilize specific resources very, very efficiently. And they are very, very, very minimally competitive with each other. Squirrels utilize tree uh, nuts and fruit, specifically North American tree nuts and fruit of, of um, uh, trees that only, <laughs> I guess, germinate at specific times. Uh, mice, they do a lot of foraging slash um, carrion. They eat a lot of leftovers. Beavers utilize trees and wood. Some of the bears use uh, plants and other, and flying squirrels and chipmunks. They, again, there's very, very little overlap. So notice the presence of homologous features amongst the closely related organisms. The structures of the face, the ears, the hands, the tail, the nose, all of the features are very, very similar looking, even though they might have different functions. Another type of evolution we'll look at is called covergent evolution. And these traits become more similar in distantly related organisms. So sharks and dolphin are a very, very good example. Sharks and dolphins, they do not really have 
too close of a related ancestor. They split off a very, very long time ago, but because of the environment with which that they live in, they have developed traits that are very, very similar to each other. So when we look at those two predictable outcomes for convergent evolution, natural selection favors similar traits for similar environments. If you think about where sharks and dolphins live in the ocean and in specific lakes and rivers, that environment is very similar for both of these two very different species. As a result of that, those traits that allow for them to be successful in that environment will further be fostered. If you take a look at their dorsal fins and their tails, their gills and their nose shape and structure and their general shape, you can see the similarities there. And, and those trait converges, uh, those traits converge in form and function and they become very similar while other traits remain very distinct for each species. So those, the fin and tail, the nose, a structure of both shark and dolphin are quite, quite similar. Um, but if you think of something that's very different, sharks have gills and, and they need to move forward in order to breathe, whereas most dolphin species have a blowhole and they have to surface in order to, to collect air. So while there are very similar traits between those two species, there are also very different traits that still exist. And I, again, note the presence of analogous features among differently related organisms. Uh, so when we look at divergent and convergent evolutions, uh, it's very important to understand that in divergent traits, those modern species become different in traits and they diverged very, very early on from that parent species. Whereas covergent traits, those covergent traits, they're distantly related species. They had a, maybe a common ancestor, you know, several hundred or maybe even thousands of generations prior but because of the environment that they live in, they start to become more and more similar despite sharing very little actual genetic linkage to each other. And then the last thing I wanna talk about with regards to, to these types of evolutions is coevolution, and it's species that have evolved together. So this is a very important fact in terms of um, extremely dependent on one another. So when you think about any type of symbiotic relationship, uh, it's very similar to this co-vergent or co-evolution. So thinking of the, the idea of the extinction of one species would lead to the extinction of other, it's because they're so inextricably linked to each other that if one goes, the other will as well. And this has effects on the entire ecosystem and the food web may in fact collapse if one goes extinct, whereas the other does not. So an interesting example is the long spurred orchid and the hawk moth. Um, the hawk moth have a very unique nose or probe, if you will, that can reach to the end and the tip of the flower of the spurred orchid. And they depend on each other to survive because the spurred orchid, it can't be pollinated by any other insect other than the hawk moth because where the pollen resides at the absolute very tip of this flower, no other insect can get in there, get the pollen and then allow for that, help out with that reproduction of those plants. Whereas the hawk moth pretty much solely relies on the spurred orchid for its food source. So if one of those species were to die out or go extinct, both of them would probably go extinct and they have very large connections to the rest of the food web, which would lead to a lot of issues in that ecosystem. Okay, that's it folks. If you have any questions, please ask and I'll be more than happy to help out. I hope the research article is going well. Um, based on some of the results that I saw from the, uh, um, the Google form that I set up on Friday, I answered a few questions in the post today. So if you haven't taken a look at that, please take a look. Otherwise, enjoy the weather and enjoy the day and stay safe.